typically when you think of World War II, Italy is not one of the first countries that comes to mind. Why is that? Finalmente il turismo! Voi che voi potete offrire al mondo panorami incantevoli e città disse volte che non hanno le uguali sulla faccia della terra. I'm Tony Cisneros, owner and operator of Outventure's World War II Tours. Today I'm at the Monte Cassino Abbey, near Cassino in Italy. The Italian campaign during World War II was the longest and the most costly campaign in the European theater. Every inch of this country was fought over. Italy became the battleground and the site of the clash between the Allied forces and the might of the German army. Why did this campaign take so long? What happened to Benito Mussolini? We're going to shed some light on this campaign and answer these questions and more in this episode of The Bunker Boys Show. the World War II experts who work on the battlefield. This is the Bunker Boys Show with your host, Tony Cisneros. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Bunker Boys Show. If you're even remotely into World War II, you know what to do. Today, we're talking about the Italian campaign with one of my friends in Italy, Sean Winter. He lives in Naples and uh, he's retired military. He does some guiding there in Italy and we will break down the Italian campaign for you and give you a little better picture of exactly how things progressed uh, throughout this longest campaign for the U.S. Army in the European theater during the war. So why was Italy the longest campaign in the Second World War? Why was it so costly for the Allies? What happened to Mussolini? Well, let's find out in this installment of Lessons from the War. It's time for more Lessons from the War. Bombastic Mussolini, the sawdust Caesar, comes to his end in the gutter, fitting climax to a life of treachery and double-cross. He led his country to ruin when he threw his lot in with Hitler. Oh yes, they saw some palmy days when Il Duce confidently stabbed France in the back. He had dreams of empire before the bayonets of the Allies deflated this false prophet. He was captured once before and rescued by German paratroops. This time he had no such chance. Partisans tried him along with his sweetheart and several henchmen. He was brought before a firing squad and in this manner he died as tyrant should and was hung up by his heels. A fitting and glorious end.
I am very glad to be able to express my friendly feelings towards the American nation. Friendship with which Italy looks at the millions of citizens who from Alaska to Florida, from the Pacific to the Atlantic, live in the United States, is today deeply rooted in our heart. This feeling, created by mutual interests, so contributed to the preparation of an even brighter era in the life of both nations. I agree with wonderful energy, the American peace, and I see the recognized among you, sons of your land as well as ours, my fellow citizens who are working to make America great. I salute the great American peace. I salute the Italians of America who unite in a single love our two nations. So uh, everybody, this is uh, Sean Winter. He's uh, talking to us from Naples, Italy uh, today. And um, welcome, Sean. Thanks for coming on the show today. Oh, benvenuti. You got your first Italian lesson. means welcome. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I love Italy. Can't wait to get back down there. Um, so Sean, uh, tell us just a little bit first about yourself. Um, you have a, a pretty amazing uh, military uh, career uh, behind you. And um, you, of course, still you're, you're still in Italy. So just tell us a little bit about, you know, your background, uh, how you ended up in, in Naples and, um, of course, your your connection to uh, World War Two history, please. Uh, what brought me to Naples was um, I got assigned here in Europe in the late uh, uh, excuse me, in the early 90s, uh, I was up in Germany, and then I got assigned down here in NATO headquarters in Naples, Italy, which is uh, the second largest NATO command, which is responsible for uh, Southern Europe, Africa, Middle East. And at the same time, I met my wife, and I fell in love, and I stayed in Italy, retired out of the Navy after 33 years. And then um, after that, I worked with U.S. government for many years, and then I started working in the private sector, uh, uh, going around Africa and the Middle East. And um, the connection here with Italy, with my family, I had two relatives that were killed here in the Second World War. And one was a pilot. He was a P-40 pilot. He was uh, shot down north of Rome and was buried at Anzio at the American Military Cemetery. And they repatriated him to uh, Arlington National. Then my second uncle, who was a Lieutenant Army Ranger, he was killed up in the Po River Valley in northern Italy around two weeks before the war would have ended. And uh, he's buried at Florence uh, Military Cemetery. So I was always interested in the Second World War, even when I was in the Pacific. I went to various locations in the uh, in Philippines and Okinawa, Iwo Jima. So, I, history is one of my favorite things to talk about and study. In, in Naples, you also are, are still connected with, um, with the military, aren't you? You've still got a lot of uh, um, activities and, and uh, uh, things that you do, uh, events that you, that you do with the military, Correct. right? Correct. Uh, I belong to a couple of associations. One of them is the Veterans of Foreign Wars. We have a uh, BFW post here in Naples, Italy. I'm the post adjutant. And uh, we're very involved with the, our active duty military and the retirement uh, community living here, plus with the Italian community in, in general. We participate in many of the celebrations or uh, ceremonies 
here in Italy regarding the Second World War. Matter of fact, the 25th of April is their Liberation Day, it's a national holiday, and we uh, took part in the ceremonies here in downtown Naples with their Italian military and the Neapolitan uh, government officials and with uh, uh, the U.S. Navy and the NATO forces too. So mm -hmm. it's uh, we're, we're quite active here in the Naples area. Yeah, are, are there many of those types of ceremonies, uh, Sean? Because, you know, uh, when I go to Normandy, of course, every around every corner, there's something going on. But <laughs> Italy, Italy, I don't I don't think of about of it uh, that way. In other words, um, you know, the and this is something we can get into is the whole topic of World War Two. It's not that it's taboo, but it's just sort of not really talked about, you know, whereas in, in Normandy, they embrace that that part of their history. So do, are, are there a lot of these types of uh, of events, uh, cer ceremonies and things, or are you finding there are more and more or less and less? Um, how does that work? No, very much. World War II here in Italy is ingrained in the society of TV programs, uh, ceremonies such as you're talking about, uh, because this country was affected so devastatingly during the Second World War. Uh, it's hard to imagine 80 years ago, this country was a battlefield and just rubble. And the fact is they have so much pride and gratitude to the Americans, and not just the Americans, I must say. It was a allied forces that came here. There was Canadians, Polish exiles, Czechoslovakian exile, uh, the Commonwealth for the British Empire at that point. They all fought over here. And on the 75th anniversary, uh, there was the Canadian element had a huge ceremony retracing their element of uh, footprints from Sicily all the way up to the Pole River. So it's very ingrained in the history here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good because, uh, like I say, it's it's you know it's something that it's so different from from every other place in Europe when it comes to that that war. I think because, uh, like you say, it wasn't just confined to one part of the country. There was really no part of Italy that wasn't uh, dramatically affected by um, by the fighting. You know, it was like every inch of the country was fought over, right? Correct, correct. We have a home in Abruzzo, which is two hours from here. That's where we go skiing. It's up in the mountains. Mm -hmm. And uh, near that uh, the city of Abruzzo, there's a little village called Pietrinceri. And that was a massacre during the Second World War. The whole town was killed, 121 people. And every November 20th and 21st at midnight, there's ceremonies retracing the uh, the that event and it's a very moving event and it's you know it's, there's a couple survivors still who um uh, were wounded during that but were able to escape who participated in it so um it's it's still valid uh, these type of uh, ceremonies here and uh you had mentioned in one of our uh, telephone conversations that um uh that soldiers bodies are still recovered uh, over there, as as they are in other parts of Europe, uh, but you're involved in in that um, either the recovery or the or the uh, identification. Can you tell us a little bit about that Correct. and your involvement? Well, there was two episodes. One was with uh, since I'm from Buffalo, New York, um, I I daily read the Buffalo News on the internet, and I saw that this Italian gentleman up in Anzio. He found dog tags of a private a Gentile. When I saw that, I contacted the superintendent, which I know. <laughs> and I told Dave, hey, I'm from Buffalo. Can I help you with this? And I contacted journalists in Buffalo, got them talking. And what happened, we had the relatives of this private who was buried at Anzio, by the way, uh, come on over and was met the the gentleman, the Italian gentleman, found it on the beach, and they presented this at a ceremony at the uh, Rome Sicily Army Military Cemetery up in uh, Anzio. It was wow. a fantastic event. So Did very they... moving for the family. Yeah. And the second one I'm uh, working on um, is off the uh, coast of Genoa. There's a couple bombers that 
crashed over there during the Second World War, and it was discovered by a fisherman. And I'm working with the Department of Defense um, regarding the uh, individuals in the aircraft. And uh, we have identified four of them already, uh, and there's several air remains and other additional aircrafts. Actually, there's four aircrafts that there was over, over there that were shot down. So throughout this area, you're, we're finding artifacts from the Second World War continuous. The idea of, of landing in, in, on Sicily before landing on the mainland, can you, can you tell us anything about kind of why, um, why Sicily maybe was, was uh, chosen? I mean, it's, I guess it is very centrally located in the Med, right? Correct. I, you have to remember going back, we were in North Africa fighting. And part of the problem with the uh, was going on, the Mediterranean was the important asset for the British Empire at that point. You had Gibraltar at one end and you had Egypt at the other. And then they had Cyprus in between, then Malta. And so it was the shipping lanes. It was important for commerce too, in order of ice going around the Horn of Africa. Uh, you're going right through the Suez and through, uh, uh, through the Med and out to the Atlantic Ocean. So one of the things was, where was the Germans weakest area? It was, North Africa was the weakest area because the Germans had to go out there and bail out the Italians initially because uh, the British were doing an excellent job. Then Rommel showed up with the African Corps. Well, the, the scenario changed quite quickly. And so, but we were learning how to fight as an army, United States was, and also of our equipment. So it was a, learning curve to uh, be in North Africa. Plus, that's where General Eisenhower learned to be a general. He made mistakes. And that's where Patton showed his uh, personality. It was in North Africa. Same with Montgomery as well. So after conquering that, the next stepping stone was where? The closest thing was Sicily. Uh, where to Tunisia is south of Sicily. So they went to a stepping stone, but there was politics involved in that. Churchill called Italy the soft underbelly. Well, it wasn't too soft. After Sicily was taken, which, um, you know, it went, despite the, the fact that it was, it was very tough fighting and that fighting really was more against the Germans than it was the Italians um, there. I think the, the two German divisions uh, based in Sicily were, were the real backbone of the, of the defense of the island as opposed to the Italian um, uh, you know, coastal divisions there. But, right. um, but after taking Sicily in, in about 38 days or so, um, what was the plan after, after that? Because um, you know, Salerno didn't happen till, till the beginning of September, but um, can you tell us just a little bit about, uh, you know, what, what happened next? What were the next steps? Well, at that point, the British invaded the toe of Italy, going through across the Messina Strait, which was only a few miles separating Messina and uh, uh, the mainland of Italy. Mm -hmm. And then they went to Toronto. And so they were driving up that side. So they're going along the coastline. And at that point, there was also political pressure about Italy surrendering. And so and after the fall of Sicily, that's when they had uh, Mussolini removed. And so Eisenhower and his staff were negotiating with the new government of Italy. Publicly, the new government of Italy said, we're still on the sides of the German, but privately they were looking for a way to get out of the war. The Italian king, uh, Vittorio Emmanuel III, he, he was playing a, a pretty dangerous game, uh, <laughs> wasn't he, by you know, having those secret negotiations to try to come to some sort of an agreement, uh, you know, a surrender, um, and at the same time, like you say, um, telling, telling Hitler, you know, we're, we're, still, we're still on the, uh, on the Axis side. So, um, so that happened the first week of September, around the 5th, I think, uh, of September, uh, right. Italy, Italy surrenders. And that, that news then was made public um, 
right around the 8th of September, Eighth. I believe. Mm -hmm. So uh, the landings in Salerno were the very next day um, on the 9th. And how, how did that, that information of the Italian surrender uh, affect the, the, the landings there in Salerno? I would imagine those, those soldiers hitting the beaches there would think, um, okay, Italy's out of the game. We should, we, this should, be, we should be able to just walk right onto the beaches. Exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. They thought it was going to be a cakewalk because uh, the Italians had given up. Well, they had a rude awakening. And the Germans were down there with heavy artillery. Um, and so the invasion did not go as, as planned. And also, Mark Clark made some incorrect decisions. He, uh, I think Mr. Clark is a little bit overrated as a general. I think he made more mistakes than, than he was uh, in the battlefield. He was more political. But eventually the Germans started withdrawing mm -hmm. up to Naples, which is only around 35 miles to the north. Okay. And at that time, then, uh, as you had said, the, the Canadians and British are, are still uh, um, slugging it out down in Calabria, trying to make their way up, up the, the boot, you know, to um, uh, more to, or less to link, to link, to up. link up with the, mm -hmm. with the uh, American and British uh, forces that landed at, at Salerno. Um, so that was a, roughly about a nine day uh, battle, something like that, well over a week to mm -hmm. uh, to secure the beachhead at, at Salerno, um, you know, enough for them to consolidate and then start their push towards the towards the Volturno River. The infrastructure here in Italy at that time, the roads are very narrow and it's not built for mechanized movement. How p the soldiers traveled was on foot. It was an infantry war. So mm -hmm. it was very difficult terrain to travel in because of the mountainous regions. It reminds me the coastline of Salerno reminds me of the Pacific Coast Highway out in California. Uh, right along the water, sharp drop towards the water to your on your right and to your left you have a mountain. That's how the road system is over there. And so it took a long time for them to move supplies and personnel as they advanced through the boot of Italy because of the road conditions. Not only that, Sean, but what about um, this, this Field Marshal Albert Kessel ring? Wasn't he <laughs> like the master of defensive warfare, you know, fortify and retreat? Um, Definitely. I think he made, uh, made those withdrawals so uh, difficult for us. In other words, when we think, oh, the, the Germans withdrew, uh, we tend to think they just they just took off, but it wasn't like that. It was a fortified withdrawal. And um, uh, Kessel Ring had a lot of these rear guard troops that their own their whole job was to delay uh, the advance of the allies and, and buy the Germans more time, right, to to set up further fortifications up north, like along the Gustav line and, and so Certainly. forth. There's just a numerous lines going across the whole boot of Italy from coast to coast. And it was a delay tactic that they're utilizing the terrain to their advantage because they were always on the high point of the terrain where Americans were always looking up and the British and everyone else was looking up. So their tactics was a delay. After this uh, campaign lasted almost two years, it was like one year, 11 months almost, mm -hmm. where the Normandy invasion went from the 5th of, 6th, 5th of uh, June to April, they're on the Elba River. Yeah. So in, in 11 months, eight traveled so much further where here in Italy it was just inches and what was slow going would literally grind to a halt wouldn't it at the at the Gustav line there um, near near casino and that distance from um, say like Salerno Naples area up to casino it's really not that far as the crow flies um Correct. maybe maybe uh, an hour drive or something in a car today but 
um, it, it took the Allied forces about six months to uh, five to six months to get up there. Um, so it was just like inching their way up there. And then that's what they found themselves in is this, this, you know, towering mountains around them where the Germans had artillery on every peak and um, really, really a true breaking point, you know, for the for the Italian campaign. I mean, we were just basically heading into a into a death trap up there at Casino, weren't we? The Italian campaign was a infantry person's worst nightmare. Casino is roughly around 45 minutes north of Naples, between Naples and Rome. And it has an unobstructed view of the Erie Valley towards the sea. And the United States was concerned about this because in order to go to Rome, you had to pass underneath this. So that's one reason why they went up to Anzio to invade. It was, it was a series of four different battles and it, it was extremely tough. And also another thing, the weather, when it's hot, it gets extremely hot here in Italy in the summertime. It'll be over 100 degrees. And in the wintertime, it gets frigidly cold uh, up in the mountains. It's snowing. And then we will have the rain. So the weather element was delaying the movement of a, uh, the mechanized division. And plus, going back to the road system was horrible. Plus, the Germans were blowing up bridges as they were retreating step by step further north. The, the Americans and the Canadians and the Allied forces had to reconstruct bridges to go across these creeks everywhere they went to. So it's a, it was, besides fighting, they were constructing. So mm -hmm. it was a very difficult period for them to do any type of warfare. Mm -hmm. um, the Polish were the ones who actually took the um, the abbey and you have to remember the, the infamous bombing of the abbey which yeah. is controversial as uh today they you know there's talk about it wasn't necessary so it, it was just a devastating uh battle up there it was they just destroyed the whole community so that was a fallout of, of this battle but it was a, a high cost it was a it, it, not just from the fighting, but also from the elements of frostbite, you know, malaria. There was, and people don't realize that, you know, there was malaria here in Italy during the Second World War. They assume it's in the Pacific Islands or in tropical island locations. No, it was, that was a problem here for the uh, fighting soldiers as well. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Anzio, uh, the landings up there um, in January of 44. So in essence, the, the, landings at Anzio were basically a, a move to try to relieve pressure off of the off of the Gustav line, right? To try to get the Germans to turn around and go up there and try to block Anzio. But Hitler had a plan for that, right? He basically <laughs> didn't didn't pull anybody really off the Gustav line, did he? Correct. And also the American general, uh, Lucas, who was in charge of the uh, invasion of Anzio, sat there he was afraid to engage and move forward because Angelo was only 35 miles from rome he wanted more supplies more equipment on the beach so he basically stayed there and allowed the germans time to come around and build up defenses and they started uh artillery uh, barrages against the uh, the troops in Anzio, and basically they were encircled. Their mm -hmm. back was to the sea. Once they they started moving, um, you know, those rangers up there by, by Cisterna, it was it was too late, right? It was by the time they, they finally made a push, it was too late. The Germans had already formed a noose around, around the beachhead there. So they were basically stuck there then, all those troops on the Anzio beachhead for, um, you said, what, about five months almost until Correct. until May of 44 when um, when the, the Gustav line finally broke. Correct. And yeah. and also Mark Clark made a, a tactical decision, uh, go after the Germans or liberate Rome. And he chose liberate Rome because it was better in the press. Yeah. And he allowed uh, the whole German army to escape north uh, that he could have encircled 
cause a lot of the casualties in the future uh, for the soldiers that are fighting north of Rome, uh, on to Florence and up to uh, Milan. That's a great point, Sean, because uh, uh, Rome was taken on the, um, <laughs> I think the 4th of, of June and the 5th of June, FDR made his big announcement, you know, um, Tokyo and, and Berlin mm -hmm. were still, you know, had to fall. but. Um, but the 6th of June, the very next day, uh, 1944, the D-Day landings in Normandy took place. And so, you know, it's like the eyes of the world looked to France and they never looked back to Italy. So I always say this right. was the, the forgotten campaign because, um, you know, Americans, uh, at least I, I know, you know, many Americans tend to forget that we were in Italy for, like you say, um, uh, nearly a year before D-Day and uh, almost a year after D-Day uh, fighting up there. Uh, that that area north of Rome then, um, can you tell us a little bit more about kind of how, what, what transpired um, on the way up from Rome towards the towards the Po River and, and uh, the fighting up there? North of Rome is the city of Florence, Tuscany region. The push was to move up each side of the coast, then come circle in north of uh, Florence, because that's when it starts, uh, the uh, terrain is different. It's more friendly for vehicles and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So the uh, troops c continue going up, moving step by step, but the casualty rate was enormous. Uh, you had the 442nd, the famous uh, division of uh, Japanese Americans that were fighting here in Italy, the most highly decorated unit, and I believe in US Army history. Uh, you had the 10th Mountain Division here as well, which is now out of Fort Drum, uh, New York. Uh, they were taking heavy casualties because of the continuous delay tactics that the Germans and the Italians uh, of the Mussolini government that was still in existence in Northern Italy were still fighting. So it was a hard fought uh, battle until they reached the Po River and then armistice was uh, called at that point. Yeah, end of end of April, then right, forty five. So right. it's really just like a week before the end of the war. Then um, the, the the Germans surrender their forces in in Italy, right? Correct. And so Mussolini, um, can you tell us what what happened to him? He <laughs> he had disappeared um, just uh, a couple weeks after after the Sicily invasion started. So around the end of July, he he disappeared. But of course, he was actually kidnapped by the king and his new replacement, uh, uh, Pietro Badalio. But um, what, what happened to Mussolini after that? I mean, he was he was just out of the picture, right? Well, yeah, in a sense, but he was rescued by the Germans up in Abruzzo uh, in the September. Uh, and so, but he set up a, a, a puppet government basically under the thumb of Hitler in Northern Italy. Uh, and it was really powerless and uh, militarily wise, it was nothing. Uh, yeah. It was just uh, remembrance of fanatical Italian fascists uh, loyal to Mussolini. And at the end of the war, he tried to flee and he was in a German convoy and him and he was uh, in the back of a vehicle and he was wearing a German uniform, a jacket, over, uh, uh, overcoat, but he still had his pants on, which mm -hmm. is his uh, uh, red uh, uh, stripe up the side, which only Mussolini wore. And when the Parson was doing the vehicle checks on Cuomo, they saw him in the back of the truck and they took him off. And a few days later, he was shot uh, up on the roadside with his mistress in uh, Lake Cuomo and his body was brought to Milan where it was hung upside down with uh, with like six or seven other fascists from a SO gas station. Mm -hmm. There's very famous photographs of that and uh, that what with, with regards to that when Hitler saw that he did not want that to happen to him and that's what they said you know when i read books about the the people who were in the bunker after that event that he did not want to have the same type of uh, death as mussolini which is the reason why he committed suicide
And you, you also do some guiding um, in Italy, right? So, um, you know, we bring some groups over there, we can connect and you can show us, uh, <laughs> show us some, some stuff, you know, I haven't seen over there. There's always more, right? There's always more things to see. Well, this is a country that goes back thousands of years. There's always something to see that everyone would enjoy. So it's not just over the Second World War. You have the Renaissance, ancient Greeks, Romans, and everything. So it's a history paradise. It, it really is a treasure trove. And um, what an amazing place, a beautiful place and amazing people. And um, I, I envy you for living there <laughs> in Naples. I, I, uh, I miss those days of, of living in Europe, being able to just, you know, walk outside and be be there, you know. So um, anyway, thanks again for taking the time, Sean. Um, well, uh, if you had a good time, maybe we can have you back and uh, talk, oh, some more, talk some more Italy sometime. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I really enjoyed it myself. Thank you very much and All right. have a good afternoon. Thanks again, Sean. That's it, everybody. That's our episode for today. We hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about the Italian campaign. Of course, we just really scratched the surface here. There's so much drama involved in this campaign. A great book we would uh, recommend is The Day of Battle, The War in Sicily and Italy by award-winning author Rick Atkinson. Get involved in the Bunker Boys show. Visit our website at bunkerboys.com. Again, our Patreon site is patreon.com forward slash bunkerboys. Uh, follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash www.bunkerboys. And we're also on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash bunkerboys show. Everyone, take care of yourselves. We'll see you in the next episode episode nine coming up here in a few weeks. And until then, be safe, America. I salute you.